It's amazing what happens when your kids don't show up. So it's interesting. We started school at Bethel on Thursday. And as of Thursday afternoon, our enrollment was 488 students, which is about 200 more than we've had in years. And it is so nice to have kids on campus. And the first day of school is one of my favorites because the kids are all happy and excited to be here. And the younger the kids, the more likely their parents are going to stand here crying. The kindergarten parents are outside, they're looking in the window going, (laughs) and they're knocking on the window trying to get their kid to turn around and wave at them. And the kid has other things to do. I mean... The day after Labor Day, 1968, was when my mom walked me to kindergarten for the first time. And it still hurts her feelings that I got to the playground and said, you can go now. (laughs) Because this was new life to me. I was excited. And, but we've got kids running around. They're happy to be here. We're looking forward to the opportunity to minister to a bunch of new families. And God is doing some great things, and we want to see it. We want to be involved. So it's an exciting time and then a little weird to have one of our first grade teachers can't be in class for three or four days this week. And our middle school and high school science teacher can't be in class three or four days this week. And all because they didn't get sick and they didn't test positive, but that's why they can't be here. So, you know, in another life, I would like to be a politician. A job where I can make the most ridiculous decisions anyone can come up with and no one can say anything. Boy. So that's what's going on. So if we seem a little disjointed today, that's okay. It'll all be back to normal next week. So last week, Rhonda started a couple of week series in our big series called Captured by Grace. And what she talked to us about last week was this question. Are you a victim or a victor? Now, it's interesting because in our culture, and I dislike this intently, but it is the way our culture is, there is power in being a victim. In fact, that is the way you get power in our culture, is you convince people that you are a victim and you can control the situations. I love the irony of people claiming victimhood who are phenomenally successful. People who have taken their lives and through hard work, dedication, and talent become phenomenally successful, and yet they want to be victims. Why? Because that's how you get noticed in our society. And we wanted to see, well, what what is that say about our relationship with Jesus. Sometimes on our spiritual journey, we have people who we think are superheroes in the Christian faith talk about what it means to be a victorious Christian. And sometimes when we have testimony time, we hear these incredible stories about how once you become a follower of Jesus, once you become a child of God, nothing ever goes wrong in your life. (laughs) And I always kind of grin, and I don't always do it because of the right reasons. Sometimes I grin because I think, okay, you have been a follower of Jesus for 14 minutes. Let's see what happens in the next 20 years. Other times I grin because I might know these people. And I know that no one lives a victorious life every day. None of us are perfect. 
There could be certain kind of temptation that keeps getting the best of us. It could be a kind of unhealthy distraction trying to get our attention. It could be a fear that never seems to quite leave us alone. It could be a dysfunctional relationship that needs to be recognized and addressed. There are probably a thousand different categories of things the enemy wants to use in our lives to rob us of a sense of victory. We read in the Bible that Jesus says, we are victors. And we say, well, yeah, but. And we've been talking for weeks now about Christians' big butts. Because there are so many times we want to say, well, yeah, but. And we will discount what God has said and done for us because something didn't go the way we wanted it to yesterday. Or even better, something didn't go the way we wanted it to 40 years ago and we can't let go of it. The enemy is not stupid. He's just bad. And he can use these things to keep us from seeing that we are victors. He wants to encourage a victim mentality. We live in a generation characterized by victimhood, don't we? Not just in the church, but throughout our culture in general. Every time we turn around, it seems like people are blaming their struggles on someone or something. No one's saying that real victims don't exist. There are times when people are grossly mistreated. We're more than understanding when they try to defend themselves. But that's not what we're talking about here. Excuse me. I'm talking about people who paint themselves out to be victims in almost every situation. You know someone like that. Don't point at them if they're here. But a lot of us see that person every day in the mirror. When something goes away, we don't like it. It's never because of anything we've done. It's always because of something somebody else has done to us. And we're victims and there's nothing we can do about it. There was an article online and Rhonda gave us a couple of points from it last week. And it was called, the magazine is called Healthline. And it talks about a victim mentality. And a victim mentality is based on three key beliefs. One, a consistent focus on bad things that happen to us. You know people like this. Nothing ever goes good. Nothing ever goes right. Even if everything goes wonderfully, they will pick out the bad thing that happened. And that's their focus. Well, they're enjoying a victim mentality. They blame other people or circumstances for what we don't like. And it's interesting because so often we confuse what we don't like with what is wrong. Just because I don't like it doesn't mean it's wrong. Just because I don't like it doesn't mean it shouldn't happen but we blame other people for that. And finally, there's no point in trying to change because we're going to fail anyway. Why should I go out and look for a job? They're never going to hire somebody like me. Why should I go out and try and do this? I'm going to fail anyway. The world's stacked against me. And so we just sit and we don't accomplish anything. Sometimes things happen that really are not our fault. A sudden job loss, even though we were a model worker. The summer I graduated from high school, I worked at a fastener company down in El Monte in the same little complex my dad worked in. He worked at a machine shop. I worked across the parking lot at a fastener company. I worked there all summer. It was fulfilling and stimulating work. I received shipments of hundreds of pounds of nuts and bolts, and I separated them by size. Wow. (laughs) 
Toward the end of summer, the owner of the company who had been on vacation in Europe for two months, I never saw the guy, I never met the guy, came back from vacation, walked in, and fired everybody. Now, theoretically, I could have done something wrong and caused that, but I don't think so because he never met me. He was never there when I worked, and everyone else, including the managers and the office staff, got fired too. Yeah, that wasn't because of something I'd done, and it was not a good thing. But stuff happens. Sometimes an unexpected illness, even though we take good care of ourselves. Sometimes a loved one that we aren't waiting for passes. You know, people die. And hopefully, when people close to us die, it never makes us happy. Sometimes people are assaulted or attacked by someone physically or emotionally. But even in the wake of some of the most unfair, unjust circumstances, the gospel has the power to rescue us from a victim mentality and instead empower us to walk in the confidence that the victory is already ours. That is what the Bible says. The question is, do we believe it? So, last week, Rhonda started looking at the first of two major realities, two huge misconceptions that will often wage war against the victory Jesus has for us to walk in on a daily basis. The first of these weapons used against us, two major realities we don't understand, the difference between an orphan spirit and the spirit of sonship. If you weren't here last week, go back on Facebook and watch Rhonda's message. We need to remind ourselves who we are. And we are not orphans who have been abandoned. We are sons of God. It never ceases to amaze me how many of us fail to understand and walk in the true spirit of sonship that Jesus purchased for us with his own blood on Calvary. When Jesus was spending his final days with his disciples before the cross, he made this statement. He said, no, I will not abandon you as orphans. I will come to you. He knew he was going to leave them. He was going to leave them in a very dramatic, very emotional, very upsetting way. And he's telling them, I'm not abandoning you. Soon the world will no longer see me, but you will see me. Since I live, you also will live. Jesus said, I will not abandon you as orphans. Even though my life is full of blessings, blessings in the midst of struggles and challenges, I could easily see myself as a victim. Often I'd see good things in life as temporary or arbitrary. You ever have good stuff happen and you're just kind of looking around waiting for the bad stuff to happen? Why do we never do the other way? When bad stuff happens, we're like, that's okay. Good stuff's coming. We don't think like that. But that's because we're in the spirit of an orphan, not the spirit of a son of God. So the first misunderstanding was the spirit of orphan versus the spirit of sonship. The second, the one we're going to be talking about today, the difference between our kingdom and God's kingdom. Now you guys are a little bit ahead of the game because we spent several weeks earlier in this year talking about the kingdom of God. And we have a pretty good understanding of what the kingdom of God is. But a lot of times we as Christians forget whose kingdom we are a part of. We forget whose rules we live under. When the Apostle Peter wrote his first letter, 
that was included in the New Testament. I doubt it was his first letter. But it's the first one that we've included in the Bible. He was addressing believers who had fled persecution in Palestine. They were seeking refuge in safer areas around the Roman Empire. These people felt like exiles because they were literally, or in the physical sense, exiles. But Peter had a galvanizing message for them in the midst of their struggle. He reminded them of their identity in Christ. Look what he says. He says, you are not like that. You are not an exile. You are a chosen people. You are royal priests. You are a holy nation, God's very own possession. As a result, you can show others the goodness of God. For he called you out of the darkness into his wonderful light. Once you had no identity as a people, now you are God's people. Once you received no mercy, now you've received God's mercy. One of the things we are desperate for in our culture is identity. We want to be identified with something bigger than us. The irony is, a lot of us choose not to be identified with God, but instead choose to be identified with shallow, superficial things. We choose to be identified with matters of taste. I tease everybody often about country music. I only do it because I found out that that's the one kind of music I can tease people about and get a lot of folks riled up. If I tease people about classical music, they just assume that I'm not intellectual enough to understand it. Country music, no one ever makes that accusation. We want to be identified. I am a country music fan. I like this kind of music. I like this show. We walk around celebrating TV shows that we watch. Why? Because it gives us an identity. We are desperate for an identity. God has an identity for us. We just don't know if we're interested in his identity. Once you had no identity as people, now you are God's people. If you are a follower of Jesus, who are you? God's people. When you feel all alone, who are you? You are God's people. When you're needing support to get through a certain time in your life, who are you? You are God's people. You received no mercy, but now you've received God's mercy. I think this scenario sounds kind of familiar. Peter is calling them to walk in the true identity while living in a multicultural environment where the forces of authority are not friendly or sympathetic to their faith. It might sound familiar. What God has done and what God says has not changed. Our question has to be, How can we be a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, and declare the praises of him who has called us out of darkness to be his people around us? God came full of grace and truth. Jesus did. Not one or the other. He calls us to walk the same glorious reality. In our bitterly polarized society, 
I'm afraid I see too many Christians despising those who disagree with them. Even other believers and sisters in the church. It tells us who our identity rests in. Because it's who we claim. It's how we talk about ourselves. If you'll talk to most people, they'll say, well, I'm a Californian. I vote along these lines. I like this kind of music. I like these movies. I am married. I have this many children. And I'm a Christian. Guess what? That's exactly backwards. But it does tell us what we identify with. It does tell us whose kingdom we are getting our identity from. We don't have to agree with people to love them. Jesus certainly didn't agree with many of the beliefs and the behaviors of the tax collectors, the sinners, the Pharisees, the prostitutes that he ran into in his day. But he loved them. He loved them to death, quite literally. Didn't mean he agreed with them, but he loved them. And what concerns me as a pastor, what concerns me as a father, what concerns me as the leader of a school, is that someone who pays attention to what's going on around us, I think we're losing an entire generation of people who see us living with an orphan mentality instead of boldly living like Jesus. We're very good at telling people who will and will not belong to our group. And I want you to notice that Jesus didn't do that. I want you to notice that Jesus loved people as people. What does it say about our grasp of his amazing grace if we can't have calm, respectful conversations with people on the other side of whatever issue they identify with, whether they be Democrat, whether they be Republican, whether they're conservative, whether they're liberal, whether they're anti this or pro that. Do we love people who are more moderate than we are? Do we love the people who march with BLM? Do we love the people who support law enforcement? Do we reach out to heal the hurts? Or do we stand back and watch people suffer? One sociologist, a woman by the name of Arlie Russell, Hothchild. She was finishing her study of the blue collar working families in Louisiana, and she observed what a seismic shift was taking place in our country. For years, hardworking people had been trying to get ahead to get their slice of the American dream, but they felt like others who were less deserving were trying to get in line ahead of them. The men and women in the study felt like victims, unwanted and left behind, as though they didn't belong. She titled her book, Strangers in Their Own Land. I'm going to read just a couple of paragraphs from it. She says, Not only have the country's two main political parties split further apart on such issues, But political feeling also runs deeper than it did in the past. In 1960, a survey was asked American adults whether it would disturb them if their child married somebody of the opposite political party. Not more than 5% of either party answered yes. In 2010, 33% of Democrats and 40% of Republicans answered yes. In fact, partyism, as some call it, is now beat, it now beats race as the source of divisive prejudice. 
our polarization, and the increasing reality that we simply don't know each other makes it too easy to settle divisive and contempt, contempt arguments. A few years ago, Charles Sykes wrote a book called Nation of Victims, in which he chronicles the way people are so quick to sue each other instead of resolving disputes outside the courthouse. The title of the book, A Nation of Victims, is a fitting way to describe the heart, the agenda, and the behavior of way too many people on behalf of our country today. People are acting like helpless, angry victims about virtually every issue you can't just be disagreed with. Those people are wrong and bad. And they have to be fixed. They have to be punished. And one of the ways we can best do that is lawsuits. Do people fear certain changes happening in our country? Sure. Are there inequalities to be addressed? Sure. Are some people taking advantage of the system while others are being left behind? That is actually how a lot of people feel. And they're correct to some degree. So these issues and many others, they need to be addressed, but not with whining vitriol and venom, at least not for followers of Jesus. We have an incredible opportunity to step into the fray with love and patience, seeking to understand before we're understood, listening before speaking, providing comfort for those who are on the other side of the cultural divide. This is exactly what Jesus did for us, and it's how he, has, it's how he is calling us to live in the world today. Think about where you get your news. Think about how you use social media. What do you talk about? How do you talk about it? How do you react to people who have opinions different from yours? It's been interesting because for the last six months or so, I am not interested in social media anymore. I don't like it. I don't want to look at it. I don't want to read it. I'm just tired of it. I'm tired of getting yelled at. I'm tired of people that I know and I love yelling at other people. I'm tired of it. And I don't see that it's how Jesus would have us behave. The question is, are we earning the right to be heard by our behavior? In people's lives, we're viewed as people who always think we're right. We're not earning the right to be heard. Can we listen? Are we interested in what other people think? Are we interested in what other people feel? We have to earn the right to be heard. The Apostle Paul gives us some incredible instruction in the book of Romans. In chapter 14, verse 1, he says, Accept other believers who are weak in faith and don't argue with them about what they think is right or wrong. Interesting how we're arguing with them about what they think is right or wrong. How can we do that? Based on what we think is right or wrong. If you've been a Christian for any significant amount of time, I bet that there are things in the Bible that your opinion has changed on. And something you once thought very strongly about, you don't agree with anymore. So what you were absolutely convinced was right, you now might think is wrong. Paul says, don't argue with people about what they think is right or wrong. The weak aren't people the most, most of us expect. 
A weak person, in Paul's mind, isn't someone who is indecisive. In this context, it's somebody who is rigidly dogmatic. We are to accept this defiant, demanding person with kindness. Instead of wrath that we might think they deserve. People we disagree with, we still have to love. He goes on in verse 8. If we live, it's to honor the Lord. If we die, it's to honor the Lord. So whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. In other words, the things we argue about really don't matter that much. Christ died, rose again for this very purpose, to be Lord both of the living and the dead. Some things are more important than being right. When I ever talk to married couples and they're arguing, often I will ask one of them, do you want to be right or do you want to be happy? And it always surprises me when a lot of people say, I want to be right. Because if that's your attitude, you ain't going to be happy. Why do you condemn another believer? Why do you look down on another believer? Remember, we all stand before the judgment seat of God, not each other. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of what we eat or drink, but living a life of goodness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Living a life of goodness. Well, most of us can understand that. Living a life of peace. Well, if we don't live in peace, that's never our fault. It's the other jerk's fault. (laughs) Except it takes two people to be in a conflict. We want to live in joy in the Holy Spirit. Now, the kingdom of God is built on the foundation of kindness, righteousness, and justice. Just as a little sidetrack, look at what God says in Jeremiah chapter 9, verse 23. He says, this is what the Lord says. Don't let the wise boast in their wisdom. Don't let the powerful boast in their power or the rich boast in their riches. But those who wish to boast should boast in this alone, that they truly know me and they understand that I am the Lord who demonstrates unfailing love. If you want to boast, God says boast, but boast about this. And I am the God who brings justice and righteousness to the earth and that I delight in these things. I, the Lord, have spoken. That's what God is looking for. He's looking for people who will support each other and love each other and be fair with each other and quit arguing over stupid things. In Romans 14, Paul goes on, So then let us aim for harmony in the church and try to build each other up. I find it interesting that Paul doesn't say let us aim for harmony in the church after everybody agrees with you. Build each other up as long as they're on the same side you're on. Harmony means we get along. Harmony means we're pursuing the same purpose. We may have different jobs, we may have different parts, but we're pursuing the same purpose. That's what we're aiming for. This is so important. 
because perhaps now more than at any time in recent history, our reputation, our witness is at stake. In Paul's first letter to the church in Corinth, he writes about how we deal with conflict even within with other believers in the church and what it tells those who are watching us. Remember, we've talked before about how people who don't belong to God's kingdom are watching God's kingdom. And why would they want to become part of God's kingdom if God's kingdom is just as messy and just as contentious as their kingdom? Paul is talking about Christians who are disagreeing on things and actually taking each other to court. Taking each other to secular court. The Bible tells us how to deal with disagreements in the church. And it stays in the church. The people in Corinth were suing each other in public. Paul talks about how they are so desperate to win that they're, excuse me, forgetting what it looks like to other people. Finally, he says, even to have such lawsuits with one another is a defeat for you. The fact that we have these disagreements means we've already lost. We're so desperate to try and win to try and prove ourselves right, to try and prove to everyone else that we are the ones who know what we're talking about. But getting involved in the conflict is already a defeat. Then Paul finishes up with one of my least favorite Bible verses. He says, why not just accept the injustice and leave it at that? Why not let yourselves be cheated? Oh boy, we don't like it if we think something's not fair. But that's because we see ourselves as orphans, not children of God. We see ourselves as victims, not victors. We know our place in the world's kingdom, but we forget about our place in God's kingdom. When Jesus called us to be both, to be light, he wasn't commanding us to shine a spotlight on the things we disagree with. Have you ever listened to somebody talk and made a mental list in your head of every area where they got it wrong? Sometimes it's hard not to do that. Or people happen to use whatever the code words are now. And if they use certain words, we know what side they're on and that ain't our side. When Jesus said we were light, he wasn't telling us to shine light on stuff we don't like. He was telling us to let the light shine so that we could attract attention. When Jesus called us to be salt, He wasn't saying that we should be salty towards other people. Please hear me on this. I'm not suggesting that we water down any convictions we believe are biblical. Jesus cared about and lived by the truth more perfectly than any of us ever has. And he still reached out to other people. Without ever compromising his core convictions, Jesus interacted with people who were radically different. Radically different from him. But he showed them a love so genuine that it literally led him to the cross to lay down his life for them. So what? Brings us to the most important question. Friends, we are not victims. 
We are not orphans. Ultimately, we are not of this world. We live in this world. We have a temporary, secondary citizenship in this world. But we're ambassadors of an altogether different kingdom, which Jesus said is not of this world. Well, I don't like how the world works. It's not fair. Right. Never has been. Never will be. But you're not of this world if you're a follower of Jesus. But I have to demand my rights. No. That's not how the kingdom of God works. Royal children don't demand their rights. They know that the children of God never go without what they need. You don't protect your rights. Your heavenly Father does. Well, I have to make things work the way I think they should work. No. You're in a different kingdom. That's not your role. Some folks listening to me right now, you may believe that America is going in a positive direction. Others may believe that America is headed in a negative direction. I'm sure that all of us are thankful for the freedoms that we enjoy as citizens of this country. We're a part of an imperfect republic. But as I've studied history for a long, long time, it's done a better job than any other form of government we've seen on this planet. But it's not perfect, and it never will be. Let's be honest. Every kingdom of this world is ultimately, according to the Bible, an expression of Babylon. What? Well, let's look at Revelation 18.3. For all the nations have fallen because of the wine of her, Babylon's, passionate immorality. The kings of the world have committed adultery with her. Every human government that has ever existed in our world is ultimately an expression of Babylon. Now this is from Revelation, so it's talking about the end times and how the world's governments rise up to stop Jesus from doing what he's ultimately going to do. Now, we might believe that we live in a better version of Babylon than somewhere else, but at the end of the day, it's all Babylon. America may be a great land, but it ain't the promised land. What is the promised land? Jesus. This is not the promised land. Have lots and lots and lots of people benefited from what's gone on here? Absolutely. Absolutely but this is not the promised land. America may be a formidable kingdom, but it's not the kingdom of God. So the bottom line application is simply this. Don't get too comfortable here. As strange as that seems, don't get too comfortable here. We don't belong here. We are not of this world. We are not people of this kingdom. We are people of God's kingdom. And when we get confused, we get distracted. And the flip side of that is, when we get distracted, it's because we're forgetting whose kingdom we live in. Are there things that may happen politically that I dislike? Absolutely. What if somebody makes ridiculously stupid economic decisions? Is God no longer going to be able to take care of my family? 
Of course he can take care of my family. He's God. Well, what about the people that aren't in God's kingdom? Well, that's up to them, isn't it? What if somebody takes the greatest healthcare system that's ever been created in the world and starts destroying it? Well, God won't be able to heal us anymore. No, we're part of God's kingdom. Don't be distracted. Don't start acting like an orphan because you forget whose kingdom you're in. Remember whose kingdom you're in. And if there are people that you care about, invite them to come with you. Invite them to explore with you. But they disagree with me on important things. I don't care. That is a job for God. It's not our job to fix people. It's our job to love them and invite them into the kingdom of God. Are there certain things that I believe and certain things that I prefer? Absolutely. And I vote that way. But those are not the criteria that are used to determine whether or not you're part of my family. And if I start acting that way, it's because I'm distracted and I'm thinking that I'm an orphan. I'm forgetting that I am a victor and I'm starting to think and act like a victim. Remember, you represent a kingdom that is not of this world. And remember that the gospel of Jesus Christ is the only solution to the ills of our society. From racism to fascism, we will never fix that. Jesus can. From police brutality to anti-police sentiment, we can't fix that but Jesus can. From drug abuse to violent crime, we can't fix that, but Jesus can. From homelessness to prison reform, Jesus can fix that. As long as human leaders insist on trying to remedy spiritual problems with earthly solutions, our struggles will continue. The gospel is our only hope. And that's why I'm so glad you're part of our church family. Regardless of how you voted in the last election, regardless of what you think about this complicated issue, if you've trusted Christ, you are a child of the Most High God. And your mission is so much higher than whatever any version of Babylon might call you to do. You are a victor, not a victim. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for reminding us who we are in you. Thank you for reminding us that our situation is so different different than we get focused on. Our situation in your kingdom is so different. And when we start to get distracted and waste our time desperately trying to come up with human solutions to spiritual problems, we're accomplishing very, very little and we're wasting a lot of time and energy. Father, we are not victims. We are victors. We are your children, and we are living in your kingdom. And we thank you for that. That is an unbelievable privilege. And I hope you help each of us 
keep focused on that, reminding ourselves whose kingdom we're in. So Father, I thank you for my church family today. I thank you for the ability to come and spend time with them. And I pray that your hand is on each one of us all week and you'll bring us back safely next time. I pray in Jesus' name, amen.